Okay. Um, so what about uh, atonement in the history of the church? Um, you may be surprised to find, some of you know this already, some of you don't, but penal substitutionary atonement, the way that most evangelicals um, kind of describe the gospel, is a relatively new invention. And I, I want to take you through, you know, uh, maybe six or seven, eight of, of the major, I don't want to call theories, but models of atonement that have been bandied about the church uh, throughout the, the centuries. And, and to start, we got to go back to the second century. So, you know, maybe 100 years, 150 years after Jesus uh, goes to, uh, ascends to heaven, the, um, the apologist, Irenaeus, kind of develops what we call the doctrine of re recapitulation. Um, reca recapitulation is, I would say, probably mostly based off of, uh, biblically based off of uh, Romans. Like it's, it's, I'm pretty sure it's Romans 5, where uh, Paul says something to the effect of, you know, all of humanity um, was included in the first Adam and broken. And so the, the we sin, sin took over, right? Capital S, cosmic power, sin started ruling humanity through the first Adam. But Jesus is a second Adam. And in Jesus, uh, sin is is defeated. Irenaeus's contribution is he kind of inserts the notion of the imago dei and so the image of God. He says that the problem with the first uh, Adam is that sin or the fall or whatever fractures the image of God in humans, breaks it, right? So that we no longer truly and perfectly reflect our Creator. We no longer truly and per perfectly serve. We can't be holy, glorified, etc. Because our the the, the imprint of the creator on us has been broken by our own decisions. And then, you know, taking on the, the, the Pauline language of, of being conformed to the image of, of, the invis uh, of the Son, who is the image of the invisible God, Irenaeus says that what's going on in Jesus is Jesus is, he, he is living with the reconstructed, glorified, perfected image of God. He's, he's true humanity that way, right? He's everything that humanity was meant to be, because Jesus perfectly reflects um, the nature and character of God and who he is. And by participating in him, we get our own image reconstructed and fixed and unbroken, right? And so he calls this recapitulating, right? Jesus recapitulates the work of Adam. He sums it all up. Every Adam was supposed to be X, Y, and Z. Humanity was supposed to be X, Y, and Z. All of that is summed up in the image of God as portrayed in Christ. And by participating in Christ, by being in him, we too have uh, the perfected image that we, were always, that we were created to have. A couple things to notice about this. Um, it certainly depends on a particular view of what the image of God is that you may or may not agree with. Um, also, it, it's... It, it, it's not about sin, that, it's not about committing sins, being like guilty of sin, right? Instead, it's about the way that sin has marred our humanity. And what Jesus is doing is he's renewing our humanity. He's summing up everything that humans are supposed to be, that is recapitulating humanity, and then giving us access to that. So it's, it's definitely different than um, some of the ways we've been told to think or about it. But that's kind of the first uh, sense of Probably the first atonement model, if you want to call it that. The next, uh, Athanasius. And uh, we'll call this uh, Christus Victor One. Uh, there are lots of um, versions of Christus Victor. Uh, this one is... Um, well, you'll see the, the difference later on. But So Athanasius thought that uh, the problem with humanity is that our bodies, not necessarily our rational soul, but our bodies, because remember he's dealing with an ancient anthropology, but our bodies are enslaved to sin. Um, they are ruled, our bodies are ruled by sin. 
And he's really riffing on uh, probably Paul in Romans 8, where Paul says, or maybe Romans 7, I do what I do not wish to do. Uh, the whole bit about, um, you know, he wills one thing, but the body does something else, right? There's this, this uh, the, 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 spirit, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, all of that bit. Uh, Athanasius is saying that, that there's, a, there's demonic powers out there, um, and maybe it's not demonic powers, maybe it's something different, but whatever it is, there is something outside of us that rules the, the body so that the body cannot actually conform to what the mind wishes uh, it to do, and, and in fact has infested the body. And, and what happens is, is the death of Jesus is something we participated in. When we go down with Jesus into the grave, again, this is a metaphor, but none of us actually got buried, so it's metaphorical, but it, participating, we participate with Jesus as he's, as he's put into the grave. That sin that, that, that's infected us is terminated, it's destroyed, which is, again, a very Pauline way of thinking about what happens um, to the power of sin in us. It's broken, it's annihilated, because it's, it's buried, right? Sin can't sin can't rule a dead body, when our bodies go down, they're dead with Jesus. And when we come back, when we rise with Him, uh, we're we're we've, we're freed from that that power. Christus Victor is uh, you know Christ the Victor, Christ the Conqueror. Christ conquered sin by terminating it in in the in the in the grave. Again, very metaphorical, but gives uh, helps us to see deeply what is actually transpiring. Notice that this is more about liberation than it is about forgiveness. Notice that. It's not about being forgiven for the past. It's about being liberated for the future. Um, so that's an interesting difference to some of our more contemporary views. Uh, the next, we'll say, we'll attribute to Origen uh, just because he has the coolest version of it. Um, but Origen's like around 400, 500 um, CE, AD. And uh, we'll call that true ransom. <laughs> Origin has this awesome story where it's like Jesus is like the uh, the hook. Um, or Je I guess Jesus is like the 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 worm, right, on the hook, and the and and the devil is like a, a shark, right, and and the devil sees the. I guess I guess maybe we're the worm, and Jesus is the hook. I can't remember how he does it, but it's this cool little image where like the the devil is is trying to rule over. Uh, humanity, and the devil's going and 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 sees Jesus and says, "Well, if I get Jesus, then then I'll then I'll have total rule. I'll have God's anointed. I'll destroy him, and I'll have all of humanity in my power. The one threat to my power is Jesus. I've got to I got to get him." And so he's like, I'll, "I'll kill him," and 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 this is sort of like God like baiting the devil, like, "Oh, you can be free. You can win if you just kill Jesus." And the devil goes and he and he snaps onto this little worm, but then the hook gets him. And, and what that is, is that, that the devil lets all of humanity go, takes Jesus, buries him in the ground, but wait, Jesus doesn't stay dead. He rises and rises and shatters uh, the devil's influence and power. Um, and so God almost like, you know, fooled uh, the devil into making this catastrophic mistake where the devil gave over humanity thinking that he was going to get Jesus, but then doesn't ends up with, with nobody at all. And you can see how this very quickly goes into the, the one of the previous videos about the, the bank robber, right? Who's got hostages. The bank robber's the devil. The hostages are us. Jesus says, you can take me and do what you want with me. Wink, wink. The devil takes Jesus, lets all of us go, and then he executes him. But it turns out that, you know, that's not going to work, and Jesus rises from the dead. But you can see that Jesus is himself a ransom that sets us free. Alright. How about moral influence? Abelard. Um, Peter Abelard was, I want to say, 1200s, 12th century, can't remember. Kind of middle, middle, not maybe medieval ages. Um, Abelard had an interesting story. He. Uh, <laughs> Well, I don't want to get into it. You, you should Wikipedia him, though, because, uh, because Abelard <laughs> had a very interesting life. Actually, on this list, there are two people who uh, were castrated. That is, they uh, had their genitalia removed. Uh, one did it himself, Origen, and the other uh, it was a punishment for um, romancing a noble's daughter. And that's, that's Abelard. So 
for its worth. Anyway, uh, Abelard said that um, that Jesus' death is an example of just how much God loves us. God is willing to God's willing, God loves us so much that that He's not, He's there's nothing He won't be willing to do for us. Um, some people think that this is a subjective. Uh, version of atonement. I don't think so, uh, because I think that uh, we objectively could not understand the love of God apart from this absolutely egregious, outrageous uh, decision to allow the creation to kill the creator. Um, what Abelard wants us to do is he wants to think about the uh, how 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 huge and how unbelievable. Uh, God's love must be that God would allow something like this to happen to God's self, right? Um, and so I, I do think that there are versions of this that can be subjective, like it's like, oh wow, like Jesus did this for me. But I think there's versions that can be objective too, like, you know, God has to incarnate, God has to come as human flesh in order to show humanity just how loving God is. Like, it's not as though God can do this without being incarnate. It's not as though God can do this without suffering uh, death. Um, and the idea then is that what this does is it inspires us. We see how good and loving God is. We see what true love is, what true life is, and we are impelled, we're compelled to live likewise. That's uh, moral influence. Uh, satisfaction, uh, Anselm. This is high medieval, period really the, pre uh, the precursor to Luther. Um, Anselm was actually fighting against a lot of these other versions, and he, he found them uh, to not quite get it. And so what Anselm does is he kind of imports a medieval uh, lord and, and, and subject kind of notion where um, in the medieval world, you know, the, the, the lord over the peasants or whomever, was owed a certain level of, of honor and respect, right? There was an exchange that went on where the Lord took care of the peasants and provided them with work, land, food, etc. And in response, they owed him a debt of honor, right? And they would give gratitude, honor, whatever, to the Lord. And Anselm says, well, this is very, this is analogous to um, our relationship to God. God is like the Lord over all the, the earth, and we are the, the people of God's pasture. And we owe God um, a debt of, of honor, gratitude, and, and, and more than that, because God is infinite and because God's grace and kindness and goodness to us, provision for us, because all of that is infinite, the, the debt of honor that we owe is infinite and is therefore unpayable. We are by definition unable to honor God as God, as God deserves. And so the reason that God uh, becomes human, that's uh, the... The title of his text, uh, Cur Deus Homo, Why the God Human, um, is because only a God human could offer God the glory and honor that God deserves, right? No matter what the circumstances, only Jesus can give God what God deserves. And so on the satisfaction view, Jesus' life actually is very important because in Jesus' life, Jesus perfectly and infinitely honors God. In Jesus' willingness to die, he perfectly and infinitely honors God. And so Jesus provides God the honor that we can't. And by participating in him, we can properly honor the deity and thus move from death into life. Now, in that telling, you can, you can already see the, the, all, all that needs to change to get to penal substitution is what we owe, right? In, in, in the medieval mindset, what we owe God is honor. By the time Luther comes around, uh, the concern is with law and the courts, guilt and innocence. Um, and penal substitutionary atonement is a version of satisfaction, but it's penal satisfaction. Right? Instead of the satisfaction that God des desires honor, to, set, to be satisfied. Now God deserves uh, legal um, perfection. You know? No sin. No, no violating of God's law. And uh, on this view, Jesus perfectly fulfills the law. He's innocent. He's infinitely perfect. And uh, God allows him to take our place. We deserve death because we're not. 
Um, Jesus takes our place. God accepts that uh, on our behalf, and we're declared not guilty. Um, and Jesus is condemned in our stead, but then rises gloriously and victoriously. And uh, so we are all freed from sin. Um, this one has come in from for by far the most critique. Uh, Nakashima Brock, Rita Nakashima Brock, I think is the first to talk about this as divine child abuse. We mentioned it last week. Um, because on some tellings that get really egregious, like, you know, the wrath of God, like, the father's, like, pouring out his wrath, and the, and the son's, like, absorbing all the wrath of God, and they're, like, dramatically separated, which is totally insane. But you can imagine how uh, that, that telling might happen. But there's a problem with that because it's not Trinitarian, right? God, the father and the son can never be opposed to one another. Uh, nevertheless, I, I, sometimes I think some of the critiques are overwrought, but in their defense, a lot of times the way that penal substitution gets, uh, or penal satisfaction gets told is a little bit overwrought, and you can understand why um, those critiques uh, probably need to, to happen. The uh, beginning of the 20th century, I think right around the 1920s or 30s, uh, Gustav Allen um, kind of kind of, uh, like, brought back Christus Victor. Um, kind of tells Christus Victor as, like, the original uh, atonement theory, even though it probably wasn't, but it was close to it, and, and, and starts to reconfigure the way that we think about um, Jesus' uh, life being atoning, because Jesus' life is spent um, defeating the powers, you know, going through and, and exercising demons, um, you know, out, out, out foxing the devil, various things. Um, this is, has been picked up by a lot of contemporary um, Anabaptist theologians uh, because what's important about it is, is that Jesus doesn't use violence. Jesus practices nonviolence, um, holy nonviolence, and in so doing undoes the cycles of violence that um, keep us under de demonic control. And here, it's really, you know, the cross is not so much something that does something. The cross is sort of like an exclamation point, where Jesus is so absolutely committed to defeating the enemy using prayer, supplication, um, doing good to enemies, etc., and exorcism, that he's willing to be murdered to not give up this approach. And so... Um, there's various iterations. That's uh, Jay Denny Weaver. There's also uh, Rene Girard, who Weaver bases a lot of his work on, kind of thinks about scapegoating as a uh, as a traditional practice, where um, violent societies use uh, scapegoats to deal with um, their cycles of violence, and that Jesus is sort of like the last scapegoat, something like that. Whatever the case, um, there's a lot of different iterations, but Chris's Victor too has become uh, very popular. In fact, I think um, Greg Boyd. Uh, just in the in the last decade or so, has uh, kind of gone on a full-on Christus Victor uh, theological tear. So, still very contemporary, very very popular. And so the question is: after all of that, which one is right? And you may not be surprised to hear me say all of them. <laughs> um, every single one of these views that has been beneficial to the church throughout uh, history is beneficial to us now. And, and canon should be reappropriated. It should be studied. Um, we should understand where it's, it's sourced in Scripture, the logic underlying it, and we should be able to, to articulate it and deploy it as necessary. I mean, if you think about it, and if you compare it to the last uh, lecture, Notice that satisfaction with Anselm is very much, it's, it's not exactly, but it's very much s similar to uh, a missiological contextualization of the gospel for Japan, right? Because Anselm is closer to the Japanese concern with honor and shame than we are. And so by listening to Anselm, we have you know, a way to speak into cultures that are not necessarily as litigious Right, that are more concerned about honor, shame, more concerned about uh, familial, familial obligations. And that's why it's an advantage to know it. And we can go on, but we won't, because this video is way too long as it is. <laughs>